Hey, good evening and welcome to this webinar, Protecting Ohio Citizens' Voices, One Person, One Vote. My name is Lynn Knoll and I am co-president of the League of Women Voters of Greater Cleveland. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization working to protect and expand voting rights and ensure that everyone is represented in our democracy. The League encourages informed and active participation in government and to increase understanding of major public policy issues through education and advocacy. To that end, we have organized this timely and educational webinar to provide fact-based information about House Joint Resolution 1, Senate, House, Senate Joint Resolution 2, which if enacted would change the citizen-initiated amendment process. I'd like to extend a sincere thank you to our panelists, Mike Curtin, former state legislator and former editor and associate publisher of the Columbus Dispatch, and Jen Miller, executive director, League of Women Voters of Ohio, and our moderator, Annette Tucker Sutherland, president, League of Women Voters, Chapter Heights Chapter. Annette, I'm turning this over to you as the moderator. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Welcome to our audience and our expert panelists. Tonight, we plan a conversation with our expert panelists for about 30 to 40 minutes. The panelists will then take questions from you for about 20 to 30 minutes. We ask you to use the Q&A function to queue up your questions. And please remember that this is a space for learning and civic engagement, not for debate or partisanship. Our experts are Mike Curtin and Jen Miller. Mike Curtin is a former Columbus Dispatch editor and associate publisher, a two-term state lawmaker from the 17th district representing the Columbus area from 2013 to 2016, and a former member of the Ohio Constitutional Modernization Commission. He started his career as a reporter. Over 38 years, he rose to public affairs editor, managing editor, editor, associate publisher, chief operating officer, vice chairman, and consultant. Today, he is a frequent columnist. Mr. Curtin is an expert on Ohio politics and author of the Ohio Politics Almanac. He has served on the boards of several nonprofit organizations, as well as the Ohio Newspaper Association. He is also a licensed umpire for the Ohio High School Athletic Association. He umpires high school bas baseball and fast pitch softball games throughout central Ohio. And Jen Miller is executive director of League of Women Voters Ohio. From a small Ohio town, Ms. Miller is the daughter of small business owners and farmers. She has more than 20 years experience working with diverse communities to promote social justice and civic action through positions with Columbus Recreation and Parks, the Martin Luther King Jr. Arts Complex, Sierra Club, the Ohio State University, and Global Gallery. Ms. Miller earned her master's in arts policy, education, and administration, a program of the John Glenn School of Public Affairs at Ohio State. She holds two bachelor degrees in vocal music and history and ethnic studies from Capital University. She is also a graduate of the U.S. Department of Energy, NREL Leadership Academy. She's a board member of the Ohio Debate Commission, the Ohio History Connection, Kids Voting Ohio, and the Ohio Women's Suffrage Monument Commission. Inspiring others to participate in civic engagement is her deepest passion. She is also a jazz singer and proud mother of one daughter. Jen, could you please open with an overview of HDR1, SDR2, and how that law would change the citizen-initiated amendment process? So first, there are different acronyms. Thank you. So you, you were used to hearing House Bill 1 or Senate Bill 1. This is House Joint Resolution 1 or Senate Joint Resolution 2. They're a little different um, in, in how they work. Uh, if, when a joint resolution is passed, it does not require the governor to sign it, but instead it goes on the ballot for the people to vote on. And so the package is designed to make um, ballot initiatives for constitutional amendments harder, both making the signature process harder. Right now, we need to get signatures in a total of 44 counties. This would require 88. It would also make the signature um, gathering process harder because 
it would get rid of what we call the cure period, which is when you turn in all your signatures as a campaign and maybe there were some that uh, you thought were accurate or weren't. People may move uh, when you, so that signature was accurate when you got it, but now is not. Um, and that cure period, if there are deficiencies in the number of signatures you have, um, it gives you a little bit of time to fix that. And then finally, um, these this proposal would require um, that ballot initiatives, uh, citizen initiated uh, ballot initiatives would have to pass by 60% of the vote rather than a simple majority of 50% plus one. And they're attempting to set an August special election um, where voters would vote on this package. Mike, didn't the Republicans recently vote to eliminate August elections? Yes, they did in December. Uh, that was House Bill 458. It was an omnibus bill, meaning there were lots and lots of things in it that to change elections administration, uh, changed uh, voter ID requirements, uh, for example, changed the, the deadline. It shortened the deadline for applying for absentee uh, voter ballots, uh, and it eliminated uh, August special elections in every case except one, and that one being when a local jurisdiction a local unit of government was certified by the state auditor as being in a fiscal emergency. So it wiped them all out except for that. If if a true fiscal emergency existed for a, a governmental subdivision and they needed immediate uh, help. Um, so that uh, law just took effect 11 days ago on April 7th, getting rid of almost all uh, August special elections. And it, it it passed along party lines, uh, 68, 22 in the House, 24, 7 in the Senate. It would have passed by a strong bipartisan majority if it only dealt with eliminating August special elections, because all 88 county boards of elections support getting rid of those elections. Um, there was widespread support. But the reason that that bill passed on party lines was because uh, of the more stringent voter ID requirements and the shortening of the period you could request absentee ballots and other things like that. Um, so uh, we now have uh, this this rush in the General Assembly to try to create a statewide August 8th primary for this monumental amendment. And this is unprecedented. This has not happened in 220 years of statehood where a special election has been called for a single constitutional amendment. Uh, so it is as irregular, as historic as it could get. And uh, that's why we're so vitally concerned about it. And the 60% threshold, along with the 88 county uh, signature requirement, would make Ohio virtually the toughest state among the 18 that offer their citizens a constitutional initiative, the, the toughest, the highest barrier to access to that ballot. And uh, that's what I find so concerning. I want to go back a little bit and take this apart a bit more. Why, why were all the boards of elections opposed to having August elections? Why was that step taken? Well, for, for many reasons. Um, they uh, are extremely um, inefficient. Uh, they are extremely costly. Uh, the turnouts are almost abysmally low. We've seen uh, turnout uh, ranging from high single digits to low double digits in uh, in August primaries and over the years. And that's why Secretary of State Frank LaRose just last year strongly favored eliminating them. His exact quote was, when you have just a handful of voters ending up making big decisions, this isn't how democracy is supposed to work. It's time for them to go. Well, that was his position last December, and now he has a different position about the validity of uh, August election in all 88 counties. And the boards of elections are vitally concerned about it because they're they're short staffed. Uh, they're having harder and harder time recruiting poll workers for regular elections, primaries, and generals, much less specials. Um, they're having harder and harder time finding poll locations because more and more of our traditional sites for polling locations are saying no now. It's not as easy to locate polling locations. And I'll just quote from one paragraph 
uh, submitted yesterday the board and the director and the deputy director of the Auglaize County Board of Elections pleading with the Senate and the House not to do this. I uh, was talking about the potential chaos of trying to get this election done. He said that uh, boards of elections have experienced high turnover, especially in the director and deputy director positions. This is due to workload and burnout that election officials are dealing with due to the ever-changing timelines and state special elections being called. Institutional knowledge is quickly fleeing Ohio boards of elections, which is a recipe for failure heading into the 2024 presidential election cycle. This letter from the Auglaize County Board of Elections is reflective of concerns in all 88 county boards. And um, what would an August primary cost? There is an appropriation in SJR2 of $20 million. And how has the Secretary of State responded to these um, complaints from the boards of elections? His public statement has been that uh, this is special, uh, that this is of vital interest to our state, and that he is confident that because of the attention that will be directed to it between now and August, assuming it does make the August ballot, that, that he believes there will be a good turnout, not, not a low turnout. Okay, Jen, um, both of you have talked about the the process um, and the changes in the process that were that are suggested in these bills. Um, isn't it already a difficult process? You have to have two different petition drives, right? Could you uh, not, walk us through that? It, not necessarily. That's for an, a, a statute. Well, yes. Okay. So the first thing that happens is you collect a thousand signatures and, and um, that campaign, you know, first, well, first it actually selects a committee of up to three to five people. It collects that first 1,000 signatures. It gets that to the attorney general. If the attorney general believes that everything is fair and truthful in the statement, uh, that then goes to the Ohio ballot board and the ballot board can um, reject it for, for different reasons. The main being that they can argue that it's not a single subject rule. Um, but if the ballot board certifies it, then it goes to the attorney general who files it with the secretary of state. There's all these different pieces and parts. And then we go collecting those signatures. Um, it's 10% of the total votes cast for the office of governor in the last um, gubernatorial election. And you need to have at least 5% of those who voted for in that gubernatorial election in 44 counties. That's a lot. That's pretty hard. Um, so we have to file that if we were going to do an initiative, we would have to file that with the secretary of state, um, no later than 125 days prior to that general election. Um, the, the secretary of state has 20 days to say if the signatures are insufficient. Um, if for some reason, uh, we didn't meet the signature, uh, mark, we would have, um, 10 days to, um, uh, sure. cure that, right, to, to get those signatures. Um, and then it would go on the ballot and it would pass, you know, it would have to pass by 50% plus one. Um, in the history of ballot initiatives since 1912, it's very rare, you know, uh, this is over a century old and it's, you know, about 70 and about a quarter of them end up passing. So um, it's it's not an easy process whatsoever. Um, we have, we believe that the constitution is a sacred document. Um, and at the league, there have been times that we have not endorsed a policy because we didn't think it should end up in the constitution. But we understand why campaigns go there. And it's because um, the initiated statute process is actually very, very rare to use in Ohio. Um, and here in Ohio, we have both the ability to have citizen initiated amendments to the Ohio constitution, or to, to bring a law change um, through the ballot process. Um, Ohioans are far less likely than other states that have both of these avenues uh, to go with the statute process. And that's because it's still very complicated and very costly. Um, but most importantly, because if Ohioans uh, adopted uh, a statute, a law change, 
um, at the ballot box, the Ohio General Assembly could just simply overturn that. And so there's more protection for the policy that a citizen's campaign uh, would be uh, championing. It's, it's much more um, safe to go with the constitutional amendment uh, because the the there is no safe haven if it's a constant if, if if it's just a statute that's passed. Is that what the state went through in the um, in the votes in 2015 and 2018 for fair districting? Did it did that initiative go through that process? No, actually, we negotiated the fair district, so Common Cause and and uh, League of Women Voters and NAACP and Ohio Environmental Council and many others actually negotiated with the General Assembly to get those initiatives onto the ballot. So in 2015, that was to reform uh, um, uh, state house mapping and then in 2018 to reform congressional mapping. But that was not done through that process necessarily. In 2018, we were collecting signatures um, but we chose to negotiate with the General Assembly because we knew how hard it would be to have the initiative pass. And were those constitutional amendments? Yes. Okay, and what was the vote margin on those fair district issues? When passed by uh, almost 72% of the vote for state house mapping and the other passed by almost 75% of the vote for congressional mapping. Okay, Mike, back to you. Um, so the current threshold is 50% plus one vote. Um, there's two amendments about districting did much better. So why is 60% an issue? There is uh, a movement nationally uh, led by Republican interests to make direct democracy more difficult. We've seen uh, several campaigns and several proposed amendments in recent years in uh, various states, um, similar to the one we're looking at now in Ohio, uh, just in the past uh, two years, um, a 60% uh, threshold requirement was rejected in South Dakota by a, a 67 to 33% margin. And uh, that was a heritage vote. South Dakota is where the initiative process started back in 1898. They were the first state among all of us to uh, adopt the INR. Uh, there was also a vote in Arkansas last year on a 60% uh, proposal. It failed 59 to 41. Uh, there was a mixed um, result in Arizona where a 60% um, amendment was approved, but only for tax issues. Uh, not any other issues other than tax issues. But this has been a um, a movement spearheaded by uh, conservative and Republican think tanks uh, like the Heritage Foundation and like Americans for Prosperity, uh, who believe that the initiative process has become too uh, vulnerable to um, things they don't like. And um, in fact, uh, Representative uh, Brian Stewart the chief proponent, uh, the sponsor of HJR1, uh, said in a memo to his fellow Republican House members that it's vital that they achieve a 60% threshold to head off and undercut two budding proposals they don't like. First, the Women's Reproductive Rights Amendment that is likely to be on this November 2023 ballot. And secondly, the expected uh, redistricting reform amendment that uh, former Chief Justice uh, Maureen O'Connor was uh, beginning to organize and is hoping to have on the November 24 ballot to create a truly independent redistricting commission similar to Michigan's and Arizona's. So the you know Republicans haven't made uh, much of a secret of what their concern is. They want to head those off. And the three organizations that are doing the heaviest lobbying in the state house, uh, in the House Republican Caucus, because that's where the action is, are one, Ohio Right to Life, uh, two, uh, the Center for Christian Virtue, which, which is aligned with Right to Life, and the Buckeye Firearms Association. Why the Buckeye Firearms Association? Because they fear that eventually uh, there'll be an organizing effort to bring uh, an amendment that perhaps would uh, impose waiting periods for gun purchases 
perhaps uh, limits on uh, assault weapons, if maybe a total ban on assault weapons. But that's what they fear. And so uh, a lot of these uh, conservative and right-wing groups want to get a 60% threshold imposed as quickly as possible to head off things they think might be coming down the pike that they would not like. Is it true that both of you, is it true that most elections are decided between 50 and 60 percent of the vote? So what do you think would be the impact? I'll go back to Jen. Um, what, what do you think is the the impact if HJR1, SJR2 are successful? This is a really important question. You know, the supporters continue to call this a good government uh, amendment when the good government groups, along with 225 other organizations um, across the state stand opposed. Um, and that includes most of the major unions. It includes folks like the NAACP, Equality Ohio, Faith Leaders, Ohio Council of Churches, many others. Um, and that's because if this package um, would be moved onto the ballot and voters approved it, which I think that opposition would be great. But if this package actually passed and became law, it would have the opposite effect of what they're saying. It would be almost impossible for anyone other than deep pocketed groups to be able to have successful campaigns. Uh, it takes anywhere from, you know, 20 to $30 million to collect the signatures, get on the ballot and then win. It's already very hard and very expensive in Ohio. And ironically, the folks that are uh, promoting this are actually special interests who don't want to see Ohioans be able to um, address our issues, you know, to, to uh, achieve the kind of future and public policy that we want in the state of Ohio. And so um, it's just utterly incredible, but um, Mike has done a lot of really good work on some of the things that have passed in the past uh, that would not uh, necessarily uh, be possible with the 60% threshold. And, and keep in mind that we would have even more things that probably wouldn't have gotten on the ballot with the signature challenges, but I would love to hear from Mike. Absolutely. Uh, the textbook definition of a landslide is 55-45. Any, anything you get in double digits is a, is a landslide. 60% is a very, very high bar. The initiative and the referendum itself, one of the greatest reforms in our history, one of the high points of, uh, of democracy, passed with 57.5. We wouldn't even have the initiative process had a 60% uh, bar been in place. Civil service uh, also came in in 1912 in that same election. Uh, we had a huge problem with uh, patronage back in the day where office holders were putting all their family members and shirt tail cousins on the office payroll. Civil service reform was coming across the country to clean that up, to make sure that uh, people were hiring for these important government jobs, uh, had tests, and that promotions would be based on merit. Uh, the Civil Service Reform Amendment in 1912 passed with, I'm not making this up, 59.99% of the vote, 41 votes shy of 60. Uh, and that's the most dramatic example, but many, many reforms, um, municipal uh, home rule, county home rule, um, allowing uh, municipalities who have their own water and sewer systems to expand beyond their own municipal boundaries so they could be truly regional providers of water and sewer. These seem are seemingly mundane, they, but state constitutions have to deal with all these things. State constitutions have to be living documents and they have to change with the times. And if you impose a 60% uh, passage threshold, you're gonna have all sorts of unintended consequences where we can't change with the times like we need to. And one great example is bond issues. Uh, because our state constitution still contains a $750,000 debt limit. That's an 1851 debt limit. 750,000 was a lot of money in 1851. It's not now. That's why from the 40s, 50s, 60s, and up to the present day, when our state government has needed to um, raise money for roads, highways, bridges, schools, universities, all the infrastructure we take for granted, they've had to go to the ballot and ask the citizens to approve a bond issue because of that old, old debt limit. 
I did some research and uh, circulated a memo to uh, the governor, the lieutenant governor, other state officials on what a 60% pass a stress threshold would have meant to bond issues between 1980 and 1924. I'm sorry, 2014. And uh, bottom line is uh, 18 bond issues were on the ballot in that period between 1980 and 2014. 12 passed, six failed for a 67% success rate. Had a 60% threshold been in place, we would have gone from a 67% passage rate down to a 44% passage rate. We wouldn't have had uh, housing assistance bonds uh, for um, returning veterans, for example, to uh, be able to buy their first home. We wouldn't have had the Bob Taft's Third Frontier Program which is internationally renowned now for allowing Ohio to compete economically in the high-tech marketplace for high-tech economic development. Third Frontier never would have gotten off the ground because it didn't get close to 60%. Uh, there's all sorts of issues, dozens of issues that wouldn't have passed at 60%. And my prediction is if we're not successful in stopping this, whenever it might appear in August or any other time after August, um, that will become evident to everyone in time and we'll have to go back and uh, and change it because 60% is a bridge way too far. I feel like we're, we're, we're writing the almanac <laughs> as we speak, getting um, a lot of history and facts here. Um, Jen, can a citizen-led amendment appear on any election ballot? No, just the fall election. I think there's a there's a number of ironies here, right? So there's the there's the irony that we you know the General Assembly just uh, prohibited most August elections. That law just comes into effect, and they're trying to have an August election on this issue. There's the irony that um, citizens can only bring um, initiatives to the people on a November ballot. There's also just the irony that if this goes before the people, it will pass. It only needs to pass by fifty percent plus one. It has to pass by a simple majority to then require uh, a, a super majority, if you will, of voters. Uh, so, so there's so many different ways that lawmakers are contorting themselves and contradicting themselves as they try to take away our power um, as the people of Ohio. Um, this is a check and balance. I think Ohioans generally believe in balance in government and especially checks and balances. And I just don't see citizens um, supporting this initiative um, if it does end up on the ballot. So, I, you know, we are doing everything we can to defeat these efforts now. Um, we were, all of us were in, in uh, testimony today. We'll be in hearings tomorrow. It was the league's honor to reintroduce um, the coalition letter again. That's up to 225 organizations against it. Um, but if for some reason we cannot defeat it and it ends up on the ballot, we'll defeat it then. I, I feel as though we can work together um, and defeat it then. I think, uh, Annette, it's worth noting that the initiative exists to give the people the ability to check government, either when government is not responsive to their needs or when government has become corrupt. And in 1912, Ohio, the Ohio State House was one of the most corrupt in the nation. It needed cleaned up. That was why we had the progressive movement. That's why Teddy Roosevelt came and spoke to our 1912 state constitutional convention. He had many messages. His foremost message was adopt the initiative. You will need the initiative because the constitution belongs to the people and not the people who are currently or temporarily in the state house. You have to guard that constitution. It's your constitution and the people listened and adopted it. And interestingly enough, the other most famous politician ever to visit the state house in 1859 when he was campaigning for the presidency was of course, Abe Lincoln. And Abe Lincoln delivered a very similar message. The constitution belongs to you, guard your constitutional rights. Uh, you know, Don't allow the politicians to, to um, hold false constitutionalism is how he put it. Don't allow them to hold false constitutionalism over you. Uh, and uh, I think I agree with Jen. If we are forced to fight this fight, we will win because we have to win because um, the heritage of that initiative 
is vital, it's powerful, and the uh, the foremost thinkers and the most resolute uh, leaders we have to look to through history warned us, don't give up that power. Thank you. Um, I do want to get to the activism part and what people can do, but first I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, what happened when you had this Constitutional Modernization Commission and was that if you could talk about that in contrast, maybe, um, what happened with trying to update and modernize the Ohio Constitution that way? Well, on this particular issue, uh, one committee of the commission, it was a 32 member commission broken into lots of committees and one committee of that commission took a deep dive on both the constitutional initiative and the statutory initiative. Uh, members uh, on both sides of the aisle felt that uh, at times too many statutory like things find their way into the constitution such as livestock care standards. And to Jen's earlier point, the initiated statute is almost never used because there's no safety in it. You can go to the time and trouble almost as much as it takes to uh, launch a initiated amendment to do an initiated statute. And the day after you get it done, the legislature can wipe it out. So we've only had three successful uses of the initiated statute process in 111 years. It's almost you know an unused tool. So what we did on our committee was how do we asked ourselves, how do we incentivize citizen groups to look more to use the initiated statute and less to use the initiated amendment, especially for things that truly belong in a revised code and not the constitution like livestock care standards, my favorite example. So we, we recommended that the full commission look at a proposal that would create a 55% threshold for initiated amendments in exchange for greatly easing the process for the initiated statute by reducing the signature requirement threshold from five from 6%, 3% plus three to five upfront, and to give the safety of a five-year safe harbor that if, if, the, if the people adopted an initiated statute, the legislature could not touch it for a five-year period absent a two-thirds vote if they were truly in need to, uh, to correct an unintended consequence. Uh, we never got that far, the full commission tabled it because there were concerns from the left and the right. I think our gestational period wasn't long enough uh, in hindsight. Uh, we're hitting people with a lot of stuff to digest. This is dense stuff when you get into it. And um, uh, I think a longer process would have served us well. But in 2017, the then president of the Senate, Keith Faber, uh, pulled a plug on commission. He, uh, for wh whatever reason, never explained decided not to put money in the budget for the commission to continue its work. And so we never got a chance to have a fuller, wider, broader, more methodical discussion about balancing perhaps the initiated statute versus the initiated amendment. Um, it's, uh, I would love to see the, the research taken off the shelf and given some new life because uh, uh, well-intentioned minds could probably find a compromise somewhere over time. And in that subcommittee's recommendations, you should just know that the League of Women Voters name is throughout it. Uh, we had Mike notes that we had uh, staff members and volunteers in every one of those hearings, including the late Peg Rosenfield, who just passed away last year, who would go to dialysis and then go to the state house um, to attend the Constitutional Modernization Commission. Um, meetings on our behalf. Um, so there was a question from Connie Rubin, and I think it's a fair one, which is there in the Senate, um, Demora, Senator Demora, the only Democrat on the committee, had put a, uh, um, tried to have an amendment that would ease the, the statute process for making a law instead of an amendment. Um, bottom line, League would not have supported an amendment into SJR2, because SJR2 is egregious. Um, and so I think it was um, a valiant effort. He knew that that was going to get tabled. Um, but ultimately, our argument will continue to be that, yes, the Constitution is sacred. Yes, we need to protect the Constitution. Um, the way that you do that is to ease the statutory process, not to leave the constitutional um, citizen um, constitutional amendment process exactly as it is, um, but ease the other process. And, um, and we'll see where that goes. The other thing I would just say is we care so much 
about money and politics. Sorry, my phone is dinging. Uh, but we care so much about money and politics. And if the General Assembly is truly concerned about that, we also stand ready and willing to work on that issue. But this package does not address that at all. Okay, so what should people do? People who are watching, if they agree with you that the um, we should not be changing the method by which citizens can amend our constitution. What steps can those people do take? Yeah, so I think there's a lot. Um, first and foremost, right now we're working to fill voicemails and fill inbox with opposition notes, you know, and, and so you don't have to do a lot. Just call your state legislator, um, both in the House and in the Senate, and ask them to vote no on HJR 1 and SJR 2. Um, we want the uh, hearing rooms filled and you can testify if you'd like. We have testimony training that's on our YouTube, I believe. Um, and if not, Michael Barron will get it on there. Uh, we just held a training. You can testify. But even if you don't and you just want to wear a button or something that indicates that that's why you're there, you can write a letter to the editor. I want to make sure that everyone is a league member. Uh, please <laughs> join the league, uh, and that makes it easier for us when we go into the state house to talk about how we represent our members in every Ohio Senate district and almost all Ohio House districts. Also, be a donor because democracy defense takes money, and then finally be ready to activate voters if we have to run a vote no campaign. Uh, and also keep in mind that the league will be educating voters on the new voting laws. And so we're gonna to need to be doing multiple things at once. Mike, as a former legislator, what do you think are the most effective ways for people who care to have an impact on their legislators? Well, I have to second Jen um, resoundingly. Uh, legislators care about what people in their district are telling them, so know who you're state rep is know who your state senator is uh if you don't know check in with the league they'll they'll inform you of who to contact and um contact them have your friends and neighbors in the district contact them be heard be polite um you know um that goes a long way uh being impolite or acting out tends to have uh, negative uh consequences so do it the right way but there is strength in numbers uh, elected officials pay attention when they're addressed it, by numbers, especially lots of polite numbers, uh, makes an impression. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm going to turn now to questions that we're getting from the audience. Um, can we submit, this, this question is, can we submit written testimony? What's the deadline for that advocacy? Well, you, they can. Go ahead. Go ahead, Jen. The deadline for testimony when you want to testify is 24 hours in advance of that hearing. That can often be very difficult. I can just tell you that on a regular basis, we don't, we barely know uh, that there's going to be a hearing 24 hours in advance, or they'll put out uh, new amendments or something uh, that we need to analyze uh, in less time. So if you want to testify in person, though, it, the, the general rule of thumb is 24 hours in advance. Um, if you don't do 24 hours in advance, they don't necessarily have to let you. Written testimony, you have more time, but I would encourage anyone to try to get their written testimony in right away. Um, it's very possible that this will um, this package will move out of the Senate this week, and there's certainly a lot of pressure to have this move out of the House as well. Also, okay. uh, there be mindful that there's two vehicles here. Uh, as Jen said correctly, the governor has no say in an HJR or SJR. If uh, the SJR gets uh, 20 votes in the Senate, that's a three-fifths vote. If the HJR gets 60 votes in the House, that's a three-fifths vote in the House, uh, it goes directly to the ballot. However, to create the August special election, takes a separate piece of legislation, takes a regular House bill or Senate bill, uh, that does go to the governor. And so I would encourage members to uh, contact the governor's office uh, by mail, by email, uh, by whatever way is publicly ex expressing strong opposition to any 
August election. It's unprecedented. As I said, it's not happened in 220 years of our history. Uh, Governor DeWine is a student of history. He, uh, he um, you know, has a respect for tradition and longstanding customs. And this would shatter uh, a 220 year tradition of respecting the voters, of putting these highly consequential questions on regular ballots, especially November ballots. Um, Frank LaRose last year said we need to get rid of August elections because they're undemocratic, that allowing a few people to make big decisions is kaput, needs to go. Well, remind the governor of what Secretary LaRose said, that he, he, he was right then, he's not right now, um, to put an earth-shattering, history-making amendment of this proportion on an August ballot is simply bad faith. It's, it's bad faith, it's bad judgment. It's 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 graceless. Uh, it's couldn't be more contemptuous of the voters. So I would encourage members to start uh, letting the governor know that that uh, an August election would be the highest insult to the voters of Ohio. Okay, uh, Jim, we have a question that says, I'm pretty confident my own legislators will vote no on these. Are there other committee leaders we can call or write? So first off, even if you know that your lawmaker is a secure no, call them because that's something that they can talk about in committee or on the floor. Um, you will be surprised how many times we know, and in, in not necessarily on this issue, but in the past where we know that we are filling voicemails and lawmakers will lie and say that they're not hearing from constituents. So we want to make sure we are telling um, the, the proponents and opponents, and especially those that could be on the edge in the, in the state house could go either way. We want to make sure their voicemails are full and their inboxes are full. But you also absolutely could um, call the leadership. I think it makes a lot of sense to put pressure on the majority and minority leadership in both the House and Senate, that's easy to find. And I'm sure Michael Barron will can put some links in the chat for you on that. And then additionally, the two committees that this is before in the House and Senate, it would be good uh, to call and let them know as well. All right, thanks. Um, we have a couple questions about what happened today. Uh, someone said they were watching the HJR proponent testimony until noon. She wondered if that went on again past noon. And then somebody else is asking, saying that just today they amended both bills to include an August special election. So what happened today? Well, uh, at, we were in hearings all day today, uh, first in the House, and there were not that many um, proponents or interested party uh, folks testifying, but there was a lot of questions. Um, it didn't go much past noon. I can tell you what I did. I was really hungry and I went <laughs> with mm -hmm. Catherine Terser to get some tacos and that was very great. Um, and then this afternoon it was in the Senate and it was a much shorter round of testimony. Um, tomorrow we will be back in the house and that's when I'll be testifying and, and, and Mike and many, many others, we have faith leaders, labor leaders, um, lots of different folks who will be in the room testifying tomorrow. You can watch that on the Ohio channel. Um, and yeah, now both packages do have, um, language calling for a special election. Um, and so we'll have to see how that plays out. And if they also still feel, if they feel like that is, sufficient, um, which seems weird to put that in a um, in a joint resolution since the governor doesn't um, uh, sign those, or if they're going to have to actually do separate legislation, which is what I think they're going to have to do. And if that's the case, then I agree with Mike Curtin. Let's fill the governor's voicemail and inbox on that. I personally would love to spend $20 million on elections in Ohio. Not like this, though. Um, so for example, um, Ohioans are facing the biggest changes that we've had to accessing the ballot since 2004, 2005, but at that time we were actually expanding access. Now we, Ohio, will have um, some of the strictest photo ID laws in the country um, and much more challenges if you're voting absentee or provisional. And so I would just say um, it's a shame that the Secretary of State did not request additional money in his budget for voter education, and uh, that would be a decent argument, too. 
to tell the governor that if we're going to spend 20 to 25 million, let's put it in voter ed. Let's uh, help uh, boards of elections improve their technologies. Let's increase poll worker pay that's not been increased in decades. There are so many ways to spend that money that doesn't have to be on an August election. Okay, Mike, very technical question for you then. Um, Jen says that there is language in these uh, twin bills that would take the issue of the August election away from Governor DeWine. Is that something, what do you think is going to happen to that? She's she's calling into question the legality of that provision. Well, the, the, uh, the SJR or the HJR creating a proposed amendment um, usually will specify what election it's intended for, but it can't create that election. You can't create an election through a joint resolution. Uh, an election that doesn't exist can only be created through a regular piece of legislation, a House bill or a Senate bill. So um, I haven't done a deep dive into the into parsing the language of the SJR and the uh, HJR. I know that, uh, you know, the the uh, the SJR was amended today, uh, Jen, if I'm not mistaken, to conform to the to the HJR one. To, so they're so they're essentially identical. Um, so one vehicle or the other could be the vehicle that ends up, uh, you know, being utilized if they're successful in getting the votes. But um, the the bill, which is now SB ninety eight, to create the August special election, is the bill that has to go to the governor. And another thought on that: um, even though they don't have a statutory role. I wouldn't, uh, I would advise those who care deeply about this to also contact Lieutenant Governor Houston to contact our other statewide elected officials, uh, certainly contact Secretary LaRose, uh, express disappointment on his flip-flop where he was so adamantly opposed just, uh, you know, weeks ago to an August special. Now he's in favor of it. Who's he listening to? I don't think he's listening to his own conscience. Call him out. Um, I would uh, also uh, encourage members to uh, send communications to our other statewide elected officials, state auditor, uh, Dave Yost. All these people have ambitions beyond the current office they currently have. Uh, they're all going to be looking at the governor's office. They're all going to be looking at the U.S. Senator nomination to oppose uh, Sherrod Brown next year. They need to know this is widely unpopular. And uh, even though those names I mentioned are not in a decision-making role, they can and do talk to their fellow statewide elected officials, they have communications. And if they see the this tidal wave of opposition, it will have an effect. Okay. I didn't realize that chat was closed. So I'll just let everyone know that if you wanted to call the committee members, it's the Ohio House Constitutional Resolutions Committee. Um, their hearing tomorrow is at 9 a.m. in room 116 in the Ohio State House. And then in the Senate, it's uh, the Ohio Senate General Government Committee, and uh, they also have a hearing tomorrow at 10 a.m. that I believe is in the South Hearing Room. Thank you. There were some very, very logistical questions in the, in the feed here. Um, Mike, has the governor actually taken a position on the issue of an August election or on HJR as JR2? He has not. He has uh, studiously avoided saying anything publicly about it. Okay. Um, someone asks, how have the sponsors responded to the impact of a 60% threshold on Ohio's ability to do bond issues? Well, Representative Stewart, the primary sponsor, has said he's not worried about it. He has stated that he believes that uh, the bond issues of most importance uh, will get 60% and that those uh, that aren't either aren't worth it or they can go back, you know, and, and re-justify themselves and get 60% later. I've, I've been somewhat surprised at his somewhat dismissal of the importance of, of the bond issue question. I think it's a lot more serious, obviously, than he does. Um, and he's made one comment publicly that uh, we have too much debt anyway. Um, and so he just hasn't been all that concerned about it. I will point out the constitution also contains a 5% limit on total debt that that 5% equates to the, uh, the, the 
the annual debt payments on all state debt cannot exceed 5% of that year's general fund total revenues. Uh, so that's another safeguard in the Constitution in terms of how much debt we can carry at any one time. Um, but these bond issues are vital, and a lot of them uh, will never get 60%. For example, housing issues have never got 60%. Um, there's a, for some voters, there's a stigma to supporting housing assistance, and uh, we never would have any uh, bonded programs for housing assistance at a time when affordable housing is a huge, huge issue across the state, not just in urban areas, but all across the state. Uh, we wouldn't have had a lot of environmental conservation programs that help all 88 counties, uh, clean water programs, um, you know, basic infrastructure programs. We wouldn't have a lot of our nicer parks, um, you know, without some of these bond issue programs. And so I think this dismissiveness uh, about that issue is is very concerning. Okay, I, I need some clarification there. Um, are you talking about constitutional amendments that created these parks and housing initiatives and that kind of thing? The bond issues are constitutional amendments, yes. Uh, they're, they're required to be constitutional amendments in order to, um, uh, the, 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 the debt, that $750,000 debt limit that I mentioned can only be exceeded by um, voter approved debt. You know, the, okay. the state can only run up debt to a certain amount without the voters approving it. So a lot of these basic infrastructure programs over the decades require voter approval in the form of a constitutional amendment. That's why Article 8, if you pull out your Ohio Constitution, look at it online, Article 8, which is the article on uh, public works and public debt, is it takes up 40% of the entire constitution. Uh, it's the longest uh, article by far because of all this language in it authorizing various in bonded indebtedness programs. Okay. And I just want to th throw out there that this bond issue especially is one that we should be talking about, right? This is school construction. This is, um, you know, fixing our water infrastructure. This is supporting local governments. There's so, you know, parks and, and conservation efforts. Uh, so, and what we're seeing is that that has eroded support, um, in, especially in the house. So I think we need to keep pointing out all of the, not just that this is this grand tradition here in Ohio that we've had for well over a hundred years, that is not overused and is already challenging, um, but we need to be pointing out all the ways that every Ohio community has benefited from constitutional amendments, if through no other way through this bond issue. Um, and I think that really helps our case. Okay, thank you. Thank you both. This has been very illuminating to me and I hope to the audience. We have run out of time. We didn't get to every question um, post in the chat, we can try to address those questions through follow-up emails to all who were attending because people who registered for this program were giving um, us email addresses and we can try to distribute information later. But it is now time for us to thank our panelists and move back to Lynn Knoll from Greater Cleveland. Good evening again, everyone. Yeah, by all means, a big thank you to our panelists who did just an excellent job uh, explaining some of the extremely, you know, complicated nuances involved with all of this. Uh, if you're wondering what you can do in addition to what's, you know, been listed and, and spoken about, feel free to share the recording of this webinar. We'll be sending follow-up emails with links to it. It'll be on YouTube as well. Um, you can search for it under League of Women Voters of Greater Cleveland or League of Women Voters of Ohio. And of course, again, a big thank you to Annette for moderating this seminar. Good evening. <laughs>